Hey everyone, this is Nick and August is done and I didn't take any vacation because I'm a YouTuber, that's not a real job so I cannot get tired. And I also can't get tired of bringing you the latest Linux and open source news. And this week we have GNOME bringing a new optional, completely optional telemetry tool that will probably still ruffle some feathers. We have a grub update that broke a bunch of installs on Arch and Arch based distributions and we have Valve basically confirming that there will be a Steam Deck too. And I can confirm that there will be more sponsor segues, just like this one. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is my favorite solution to run a Linux or gaming server. It's what I use to run my own Nextcloud instance and my own only office server. The interface is super easy to use. They are affordable, they have tons of documentation online, and they have one-click deployable servers for a ton of applications or games. For example, Focal Board. If you don't know about it, it's an open source alternative to tools like Trello, Asana, or Notion. It lets you create milestones, keep track of your nodes, have a bird's eye view of your projects, and it basically helps you get stuff done. And you can deploy your Focal Board server in one click from your Linode dashboard, something I should probably do to ensure that I keep delivering my videos on time. And to get you started, Linode is giving you $100 of free credit to get your own Linux server or gaming server running. To get access to that, just click the link in the description below. So GNOME has released a new tool called GNOME Info Collect and its purpose, as stated in its name, is to collect information about your system. Now before you jump on forums or the comment section or angry and mean, don't worry. First, this new telemetry tool won't be installed by default on GNOME. It will be completely optional and opt-in. If you choose to install and enable it though, you'll send a bunch of anonymized data to GNOME, including the distro you use, the architecture, whether you have Flatpak and Flathub enabled, a list of installed apps, the extensions you use, and the status of a bunch of preferences that GNOME offers. The tool is entirely command line for now and will ask you for confirmation before sending that data and it will even display it to you so you can check what's being sent. Now the goal of course is to let GNOME developers know what people use and what they should focus on. For example, if they realize 90% of users have the system tray enabled as an extension, maybe they'll decide they need to make it a part of the core desktop. Or if no one uses multi-monitors, they can deprioritize issues and work linked to that. The tool is available as a snap, it's also on Arch, you can get a copper repo on Fedora or an OpenSUSE repo. Personally, I think it's a great idea. It's completely anonymous and it will definitely let GNOME developers know what their users actually use and what they should focus their work on. And it might also be able to shut up people who think that GNOME doesn't listen to their users. Just install the tool and let them know what you use. Another week, another update to a critical component that breaks something. The issue this time is a grub update pushed to users of Arch and some Arch-based distros that made some systems incapable of booting. Looks like Grub introduced a call to FW Setup, a tool that tells the computer to reboot on the manufacturer's BIOS. The issue is that the installed version of Grub might not have support for that command, and in that case, Grub failed entirely. As a result, some users had to ch root in their system and rerun Grub install to install the latest version of Grub. The issue escaped testing as many Arch users don't use Grub and the issue didn't affect all people that actually do use Grub. The problem shouldn't impact distros that have a longer package review process, but that's also thanks in part to bleeding edge distros who caught it by having the problem. Now, it feels like another issue where a project might have communicated better on what they changed and distros might have done a little bit more testing to check what actually had changed and the impacts. And that's also why I don't run Arch-based distros on my production systems. I love Arch, but I need my computer to be able to boot every time. GNOME developers have some cool updates to share this week. First, GNOME Maps is getting ready for GNOME 43 with a GDK4 port and with an update to its various libraries to better support OpenStreetMap. Then we have Login Manager, the program that lets you edit GNOME's login screen. It got a new icon, new dialogues to show error messages, it will offer a logout dialogue when applying the new settings, and the app has seen a few changes in its code, 
which means current preferences will unfortunately be lost. Gradients, formerly known as Advita Manager, now has a presets manager that lets you download other users' presets to style your LibAdvita apps. It has a welcome screen and it better handles its theme inspired by Android's Material U. There's also a new extension called Pano, which is a visual clipboard manager that will appear as a strip in the bottom of the screen with code blocks, color codes, images, links, text, and file operations. I've been using Clips as my clipboard manager, which is an elementary OS app, but honestly, on my GNOME systems, Pano looks like a much better option, so I will definitely try it out. It looks really good. And I also still need to try Gradients to try and style my Fedora desktop a little bit more. Still on GNOME, there's an update to FWUpD, the firmware updater tool. And it should bring a lot of improvements to the new device security feature of GNOME 43 that I talked about last week and that Ubuntu is pondering not shipping. Firmware update now reads the system BIOS settings and is able to change these settings if the user wants to. Now this of course needs some device specific tweaks from the manufacturers, but it's already supported on Dell and Lenovo devices, at least modern ones. This means that if that new device security feature in GNOME reports issues with BIOS security, the graphical tool will be able to let the user change these settings immediately. This graphical interaction won't be in GNOME 43, but for GNOME 44 it should be good, as it seems to require a bunch of testing to ensure that the attributes that are changed are actually really safe to change. So it means that in the future with GNOME you'll be able to see if your device is vulnerable and change that state and make it more secure just by a few clicks, which is actually pretty cool. Now let's talk KDE, as the developers introduce the ability to rebind the buttons on your mouse. Each button can be assigned to keystrokes or keyboard shortcuts, which means multi-mouse buttons will be a lot easier to configure in KDE. On top of that, Discover now lets you choose the frequency of new update notifications, and it toned down the notification harassment, so you shouldn't be bombarded with notifications for updates after each reboot. Discover also now has an improved updates page, with the correct installed version for firmware updates, and it supports animated images for screenshots. The audio page of the settings will be more streamlined to use less space, and the app selection dialog for sandboxed apps is now usable with a keyboard. Important bug fixes include Discover blocking automatic sleep when installing updates or apps, and KDE apps getting a big speed improvement for copying files, especially with NFS. Pretty cool stuff, this mouse button configuration thingy. It might make my MX Master 3 a lot more useful on KDE because I've absolutely never use any of the extra buttons. Now still KDE adjacent, the MAUI project has a big update to share to MAUI Shell, their desktop environment, and their apps. The Shell is now able to reboot, power off, halt, or suspend the computer. It supports application menus and screen rotation, so it should now be a lot more usable than its first preview release was. The developers also updated the general style of MAUI apps, with support for light, dark, and adaptive color palettes, the later one being based on the wallpaper. It's also now possible to pick an accent color, change the border radius for window corners, toggle animations on or off, change icon sizes, and more. In terms of apps, the file manager can now be single instance, so new directories will open in new tabs instead of new windows. The image viewer now lets you disable GPS scanning of your pictures and starts faster, the document viewer lets you open documents in multiple tabs, and there are new apps like Fiery, a web browser, Strike, a code editor, or Agenda, a calendar. Now the MAUI project really looks super interesting to me. It's definitely not complete, whether in the shell or in the apps, but they have a great design, some good ideas, and I think it warrants a dedicated video really soon, so maybe next month. The Kubuntu team is expanding their hardware lineup. They already had the Kubuntu Focus laptop, a very, very powerful beast, and now they have the Focus NX Mini Linux PC, which, as its name implies, is a small form factor desktop system. It uses 11th gen Intel CPUs, either an i5 or an i7, and both with their XE graphics. 
It can go up to 64 gigabytes of fast 3200 MHz RAM and up to 6 terabytes of storage. It has Thunderbolt, an HDMI port, a mini display port, three USB-A ports, gigabit ethernet and an SD card reader and a two-in-one audio jack. Of course, it runs Kubuntu, although there's nothing stopping you from installing anything else in there and it has Kubuntu branding on the top. It starts at 695 US dollars for the base config with an i5, 8 gigs of RAM and 250 gigs of SSD. It feels a bit steep in terms of price, but it does look like a nice small form factor desktop that will be able to do basically anything you want it to. RISC-V computers are here, as the Pine64 introduced their first single board computer with a RISC-V CPU. Now, if you don't know about it, RISC-V is an open instruction set architecture that lets people design CPUs through open collaboration. Think about it as the open source CPU architecture, if you will. So this new board is called the Star64, and it's just a prototype for now. It uses a Star5 JH7110 CPU, which is 64-bit and has four cores clocked at 1.5 GHz. It also has an Imagination Technologies GPU, which they call mid-range, and it can come with 4 or 8 GB of RAM. It has USB 3, 2 native gigabit Ethernet ports, on top of USB 2, an audio jack, and a barrel plug for power. It supports Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.2, and has the usual slots for a camera, eMMC memory, and a micro SD slot as well. Efforts to support that little board are already underway, as Debian and Fedora are being ported to that specific CPU. The Star64 will be available to developers in a few weeks, so it shouldn't be long before we see what this little board can do. I'm eager to see what this CPU architecture can do. It should be easier to support than multiple ARM SOCs because there's open documentation and it's pretty modular as you can build like small CPUs with the basic instruction sets or very complex one and more powerful ones with extensions to that instruction set. And let's complete the video with some gaming news. First, the Steam Deck now passed 5,000 games certified with 2,132 titles verified and 2,869 games playable. There are also 1,948 games marked as unsupported, so it's about 7,000 games reviewed in total. This means that the Steam Deck probably has more games than any console that ever existed, not including backwards compatibility, and that's only the games Valve reviewed, which is amazing. And speaking of the deck, Valve has confirmed it would have siblings. In a small booklet they released as they're expanding into Asia, they said that the deck would see new versions and improvements to the hardware, basically a Steam Deck 2 or new models of the current deck. They also reiterated that SteamOS would get an independent installer so it can be used by anyone on any device. Next we have Lutris, now supporting Amazon Games as a native integration, on top of being now completely available through Flathub and Flatpak, which means that it should now be officially stable and perfectly usable on the Steam Deck, for example. It will also install the game launcher before asking users to log in for the integrations that use a Windows launcher like Epic Games or Ubisoft, which should let users log in just once to play their games. Crossover 22 was also released with a brand new GUI that looks miles better and more user-friendly than the previous one. Crossover is a paid version of Wine with its own installers and commercial support for when you really want to make sure your Windows apps keep running. I'd say the new GUI makes it on par with Bottles now. Finally, Wine 7.16 was released, adding WoW64 support for the X11 driver, session storage in MSHTML, and fixing 20 bugs, including for games like Metal Gear Solid 5, Watch Dogs, Ragnarok Online, or Saints Row 2022. So I just installed Lutris on my Steam Deck, which now lets me play Far Cry 5, which I got as a bundle with a microphone of all things. So yeah, I'm pretty happy about that. Just like I'm pretty happy about today's sponsor, Tuxedo. Tuxedo is a company based in Germany. They make laptops and desktops that run Linux out of the box. They have a huge range of devices from the smallest Ultrabooks and Nux to the biggest gaming laptops, gaming PCs, workstations, you name it, they have something for every price point and for every need. All their devices can be configured with CPU options, GPU options, SSD, RAM and a lot more. You can even have your own graphics design or logo engraved on the lid of your laptop, which I did on my Stellaris 15 and it looks amazing. And they also have tons of keyboard layouts, plenty of distro options, 
but you can also just install any distro on them because the hardware just supports Linux. And if there are a few tweaks needed here and there to make sure that everything works perfectly, well, they have PPAs and repos that let you install their configuration tools to make sure that everything runs perfectly. So if you need a new device that runs Linux out of the box, just click on the link in the description below and get yourself a tuxedo device. They're really, really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment, to share it on various social media platforms, whatever floats your boat. And if you didn't like the video, well, it's okay. You can dislike it. It won't hurt my feelings. As long as you tell me why in the comments, politely. And if you want to help support the channel, well, you can either join my Patreon subscribers or YouTube members and get access to a weekly podcast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover, or you can just donate using the super thanks button or the PayPal link in the description. So thanks everyone for watching, and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!